Greetings, I'm Shad, and last year I had the wonderful opportunity to travel to Britain and see many castles in person, and one of the interesting things that happened is that while exploring many of these castles, I got to see, with direct first-hand examples of the real thing that actually debunked or contradicts a couple of really big common misconceptions about castles. So far from me just saying that this is right or this is incorrect, in this video I get to show you the real life examples of what these castles were actually like and why some of the factoids around castles that are popularly promoted and shared are actually wrong. So let's get started. Shadow So remember how many people often say that castle spiral staircases like this only ever spiral clockwise because it gives a supposed advantage to people defending on the higher level? Well, I'm here at Kefili Castle, and wouldn't you know it, this spiral staircase is rotating counterclockwise. One of the uh, kind of common myths that people report about castles is that all internal spiral stairwells like this rotate this way. Clockwise, and the logic is that you know uh, if people are right-handed, it's hard to do you know swings and everything as they go. So as they're going up, they have the sword. It's hard to try and attack. Or you could just switch the weapon to the other hand. The other reality is is that not all castle stairwells were like this. Um, I think about oh, seventy percent were. So it was common enough, but there was another like thirty percent that rotate the other way. If the enemy has breached the castle to the point where you're fighting on stairwell, like a rotating stairwell like this, you're probably already screwed. Like, it's, you're not in a good position. Um, and so even then, say you're right-handed and you're fighting up here, it's pretty easy to fight and get the sword around angle, even if you have a shield. And left-handed, right-handed, like, I, it's actually not a good way to fight. And even on top of that, right, the person lower, lower on the stairwell, and it's always assumed that the attackers need to go from the lower end up. The person on the lower end actually has the advantage in combat because it's so easy to strike at the legs and it's so hard for the person on the higher you know, level to protect their legs where you can protect your head at which, and your legs are too far away for them to hit you. You can protect your head pretty easily and then strike at their feet and they're in a much worse position. And so to think that stairwells are great defensive elements on a castle where you would want to make your last stand is wrong. Actually one of the worst places to try and fight off attackers. Something that people sometimes say about stairs on castles is that they were purposely made uneven. Uh, and this would be advantageous in sieges because people who are not familiar with the stairwell they would give a higher chance of tripping because the steps are uneven. And I'm not so sure that that was the reason. Another explanation is that they had that size of stone and it fit there and they just put it there and it was uneven. It's like, oh, well, we'll live with it. <laughs> so um, to try and force in that there was definitely a specific reason for this design feature on every single part of a castle, even to the uneven steps on, on all these stairwells, I'm not so sure fits. The floor that I'm sitting on right here is very, very uneven. Uh, the most likely explanation for this is the ground has settled over the hundreds of years this castle has been here. Depending on which section of the castle, you're looking at between 700 to 900 years old. This section is probably close to maybe 700. Um, but anyway, after <laughs> over that long period, it leaves ample time for the ground to settle in uneven places, which leads to a very uneven surface to walk upon. That is not to say it was this uneven when it was built. Much more likely is that these stones, and again, they get, they've been worn down over the at least 700 years of people walking along this, right? And which wears down parts of the stone, makes it uneven, a lot of... The, if it was mortar in between, the stones have been worn out as well. But like, look at how deep this thing is. Um, and so the, what we're seeing here is mostly the effect of aging. It would be incorrect to try and say that this was what it was like in the medieval period. And they did it on purpose because people who lived here would be used to the uneven ground and it would be less likely, but the attackers, just like they say with, with you know, uneven stairs, would be more likely to trip. And it's an intentional feature with the design. No, probably not. And I get the feeling that 
People who made the castle knew what you know level floor felt like walking upon, and they <laughs> intentionally did it. And also another thing, like if um you're defending the castle at this, if you have attackers attacking and you're forced to defend in this part of the castle, you're probably already screwed because they've breached the outer wall, right? And so to go to the trouble that we might be able to make them trip by making an uneven floor or uneven stairs is a bit more of a silly assertion, in my opinion. What is almost frustrating about how great this is, this is great, right? It really demonstrates how little we see an authentic kind of medieval decoration where in film depicting the medieval period do you see rooms like this inside castles? Think about that. How often? You know? And so, like, it's like Hollywood ha has a different medieval style in their head that they think, ah, oh, people, that, this would just look better for people. Instead of trying to depict it like what we think modern people would appreciate in design, how about we be more authentic to the, how accurate it should be? Because uh, it looks phenomenal. Now, you have to bear in mind, in terms of the color, right? This is all a sign of incredible wealth, okay? Because the average poor person, yeah, they might be able to whitewash their homes, but hiring a painter, because it would take a, a, like an actual talented painter, especially these murals and stuff, to do all this work. And then getting access to the pigments and the colors of the paints, also very expensive. So this is a huge sign of incredible wealth, and many nobility would opt to trying to do that to display it, and also why a lot of clothing was colorful on top of that. Another interesting misconception is not necessarily a misconception, but it can arise when the pendulum swings too far in the opposite direction. And I've mentioned many times that castles were very regularly plastered and whitewashed on the outside. It was a means to uh, protect the stone, uh, avoid, you know, rain damage and other things, and also just make it look far more immaculate. But we don't want that pendulum to swing too far to think all castles then, without exception, were all whitewashed. No, there was quite a good number of castles that had bare stone. And I'm standing in front of one right now, Carnarvon Castle. Uh, well, how do we know that it wasn't whitewashed in the past? Okay. It's the uh, dressed stone on the outside. Not only is the stone far, uh, I guess, placed together more precisely with a smoother front, and it's weathered now, but it would have been even far smoother when it was made. Have a look at um, the pattern that the stonework makes. Do you see how there are lines going up on the castle? So there's dark grey stone, uh, with a lighter kind of line of different coloured stonework, and it goes up, and, and there are multiple lines going up the castle. That was intentional, and it was specifically made to emulate or reflect the walls of Constantinople, which had a similar pattern of having a different type of stone making straight lines along the walls. And it was done as a type of external decoration. You wouldn't see that if it was plastered and whitewashed. And so Carnarvon was built intentionally to be bare stone, but not rough stone. This is dressed stone, fancy stone, with a distinct pattern, which made it look pretty, I mean, it looks awesome now, would have looked even more incredible back when it was made. And so don't let that pendulum swing too far. Not all castles were whitewashed. Of course, there were stone ones, raw stone, but dressed stone, not rough. So I'm here at Warwick Castle at the moment, and it's just a, a great time to point out a common misconception that we see about castles in many, both historical adaptations, films, TV shows, but fantasy especially, this is the height the Merlon should be. So if you're unaware, this is called crenellations, okay, it's a crenellated wall, and it is comprised of a tooth, which is the Merlon, and a gap in between, which is called the crenel, hence crenellations. Oftentimes in movies and everything, they're not tall enough. These are supposed to give you cover from enemy arrow fire, and so to give proper cover needs to be head height. There's two examples that really stick out where you can see the crenellated battlement and it's only come up to the waist. Helm's Deep in Lord of the Rings, and there is a castle siege in one of the later seasons of Game of Thrones. Again, not high enough, but whenever you go to historical castles, we've seen this on all the historical castles we're visiting in Britain, proper crenellated battlement, Merlon, head height. So I'm at Warwick Castle at the moment, and I'm standing in front of a very impressive armor and weapons display. And just on a side note, this is displaying some of the most gorgeous, I guess, it's Renaissance armor, actually. People often assume that this is medieval. This is actually 16th century armor, and it shows 
almost the peak of armor design and development. And then, of course, we have weapon displays here. Now, something interesting about the weapon displays, people interpret that and think that that's actually a medieval type of uh, decoration, especially when you look at these cross swords up on the wall. What you actually, well, what people need to realize, that's actually a more Victorian type of decoration or interpretation of medieval uh, uh, interior design. And we see it copied in, in in films depicting history, as well as uh, fantasy depictions. And so if you see fairy tale like movies or TV shows showing the inside of castles, you actually see weapons on walls. The actual thing is, the reality is, these were things to be used, not displayed. And so there might have been the occasional uh, exception where there could have been a weapon on the wall, but it would have been close to get access to. Rarely ever would they have their cross swords on the walls for display. Again, that would be kept in the armory or ready to be given to the Lord by his squire. And so it looks gorgeous, but not to be confused as a medieval type of decoration. So we're in the servants' corridors of uh, Warwick Castle here, and there's a couple of really interesting things to note. I, I, I should point out the thing that's probably jumping out at you. This. If you think the, uh, I, you know, witch's cauldron is just a thing of fantasy, you would be wrong. This is massive. It is, yeah. It's our, our gorgeous porridge pot. And 500 years old, bell nestled. So when you hear church bells, and there you go. what's really interesting, we were at Carnarvon Castle and they had these fireplace kind of openings which had these big lit kind of rimmed things for something to sit in. Hmm. We've just found the type of thing that would sit in this. Yeah. Right here is interesting because there's a, what they had here, what we saw on an image, were big kind of boiling pots. Almost like big cauldrons. And you can see how you got this lit angle here, so a big massive pot would sit right in here, and you could cook up huge stews. And, I, and it was huge, it, and yes, because the actual cauldrons were huge. So this, you could brew a, a stew in here that would feed an Absolutely. army, like, like this. Absolutely, yeah. You would need a big, you know, like thing to stir it. You also mentioned that perhaps, uh, oh no, it was used as a punch bowl. It was, I mean, it holds 130 gallons of liquid. And so for the later family in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, they thought, well, we have these big parties and we need to, of course, keep our, our guests well drunk. So we filled it with punch and they just dunk a glass in, keep drinking again. So it's the biggest punch bowl on the council. I love it. And this is not something I've ever seen before, this, uh, this scale, this size. But it goes through, because some of these castles had a very large amount of people staying here mm -hmm. at, at many times. And so when you're trying to feed a large group of people, yes. You need something this big, mm. which is astounding. But Ben, you mentioned a very interesting fact about how servants were treated specifically mm. here at Warwick Castle. Yes, I mean, you see all the time TV shows and movies where servants mm. are often mistreated or they're, they're mm. paid badly. It's mm. a horrible life to be a servant. When actually working as a servant, especially here at Warwick Castle, was mm. a good job. The rate of pay was fair. Mm. Um, you would sleep on site. There were bedrooms upstairs for servants. And they were so kind to their servants here. If you had decades of loyal servants and they got too old to work, you don't just throw them on the streets. Mm -hmm. You say to them, well, you've, you've done your duty. You can stay here on site free of charge for the rest of your life. And that's what they did. I want people to just pay attention to that. For loyal servants that served a good while, after their years of service, they were given a place to live for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is extremely generous. We don't even do that in the modern day. But like, you know, yeah, you get long service leave, but once you're gone in the business, you're gone, you're right? Right. And, and so the idea that there was always this divide between the classes and they're always at, you know, uh, fighting each other is complete bunk. Yes, there was times when there were revolt, like the peasants revolt and other things where, when there was class division, but there are other times in which they got along pretty well. Mm -hmm. The nobility served a very important role in the medieval period. One of the original exchanges in the feudal system was protection. Mm -hmm. okay? Like, yes, you farm my lands, okay, give me a portion of what you're working on my lands, and I will give you protection. I'm here at Warwick Castle and I'm standing in the attached chapel. Now this chapel was, uh, it's a bit of a mix. It has things 
that are left over from medieval period, like the stained glass, it was taken from other cathedrals and things, uh, but it, it was mostly built in a much later period, 17th century to be specific. But there is an interesting misconception that you'll see here, that because when people see a uh, chapel like this, especially adjoining a castle, they will then assume this is what a medieval chapel would look like. Not necessarily. Uh, one of the big misconceptions that you'll see here that you won't see on medieval chapels are pews. Medieval chapels, they stood. And so having areas to sit is a much later feature. Look at this beautiful grand tower standing right here. Something that I'm already loving about it is that this castle, again, so much more representative of the standard size of castles in medieval times where we have this primary fortified tower, and maybe a gatehouse and an outer wall. And the rooms inside that tower, not necessarily that big, but we all get hooked up on the big grand ones. And look, I love them, you know, carefully, Carnarvon, but people then think that that was what most castle sizes were like. But no, look at this, probably four or five stories, a room meet on each level, and then some outer walls, gatehouse, maybe some smaller buildings on the inside, hugging the inside of the wall, like a stables, blacksmith, all that but still nowhere near as big as people assume. So I'm here at Cardiff Castle, and there's actually a great representation of painted on stonework. So this wall would have been plastered and of course painted, but what we see here is then on top of that, they've actually got a pattern or painted on brickwork to make it actually look like it's fancier dressed stone. And it even goes into the archways that we see above here. This was actually decently common because you rarely ever see rough stone like we see on many of the castles where the whitewash has uh, deteriorated and you see the rough stone. And it actually looks pretty good. And at a distance, you might almost think of it as somewhat convincing, uh, but it's interesting because Cardiff Castle is a bit of a Gothic revival, 18th century interpretation of what medieval interior decorating was like, you know, uh, the fashion and stuff. But this room here is decently accurate to what a lot of interior rooms would have been like in the medieval period. This painted and then fake painted on brickwork over top. So I'm inside the banquet hall of Castle Co, and this one actually is quite impressive in how authentic it is. This very well could be a uh, 13th century banquet hall with only one or two little oddities, but one of the th some of the things that is perfectly accurate is what they've done here. So the, the actual stone has a plaster over top and then they paint stuff on top. And what they've done, they've actually painted brickwork and then they've painted patterns on that brickwork. And this kind of painted brickwork is all along the walls. And then above that brickwork, we have murals and paintings, very religiously inspired. These ones look to be of certain saints. Something that is not accurate to the medieval period is actually all the portraits. Uh, instead of hanging, you know, paintings on the walls, well, they usually just paint directly onto the walls itself. Now, this room, you were saying, is mostly untouched. This is very much close to its 14th century. Pretty much, yes. Um, a lot of the other tower rooms are modified in, mm -hmm. in the more modern era, the Victorian era, for example. Whereas this room, for some strange reason, the family didn't want to touch it. Um, it was open to the public for a while, so there's a bit more modern graffiti in here, but for the most part, it was just left closed off. And that's why in this particular room, we do have graffiti dating back to the 14th century. Yeah. One of the things that really stands out to me, okay, is it does not look like there's any original plaster work on the walls. Now, in a lot of the castles we've visited, I've been making, I guess, specific, paying a specific attention to plaster on walls. And I've also mentioned that it wasn't universal. When they didn't have plaster on walls, it was usually because the stone was fancy. It was well fitted and properly dressed, nice looking stone. Because that's what we see in medieval art. Mm -hmm. When you see bare stone in medieval art, the type of stone you see is what we're standing in right now. This is actually a gorgeous example of what a bare stone room would have looked like, like an upper class bare stone room, because these stones are very smooth. And they're so smooth, in fact, I had to take a double take. I was thinking, <laughs> 
Was this restored? Because there's not there's so little weathering on it. But Ben, you mentioned no. This is actually 14th yes, century. Yes, they, they kept it as, because the um, the windows and cells would have been wooden shutters or lancets. So yes. the elements would have been kept away from the room. So the sandstone itself, sand, it's all trassic sandstone. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to cut, easy to, to shape. Mm -hmm. um, it will weather quite easily as well. But as long as the room is kept wind free and yeah. dry, not a problem. And it's nice and warm in here as well. Like it, it genuinely really surprised me. So because we look here, see how well fitted the stones are one to another, okay? And it looks so nice that you don't need to plaster it. You don't need to wash, wash it. A lot of the walls that we saw um, in a lot of the other castles, it was very mismatched, you know, kind of messy stone, so you can see why they would want to plaster it. And we actually see some of the original plaster still on the wall here. Do you see this? This is original plaster on the wall right there. And so that shows you that this room originally was fully plastered all the way around and would have been whitewashed and it would look pretty stunning as a result. But also take note of the type of stone we can see now that the plaster has worn off. Smaller brickwork, mismatched, not dressed or smooth or fitted together with nearly the level of precision that we can observe on stone that was made to be seen as the primary surface of the wall. So I'm here at Tritower Court and there's also a castle here to be seen as well. And one of the most stunning things about this location right here is that they have recreated a very authentic and historically accurate banquet hall. And one of the things that I absolutely love, which I've mentioned already in videos, is the wall carpets. Now it's hard to say exactly, because there's a number of ways you can describe them, as in hanging carpets, uh, hanging tapestries, wall brocades. Uh, so feel free to use anyone. I think I'll just call them wall carpets, but we see these depicted in art all the time on interiors. And uh, I've been out to see a number of medieval rooms recreated, and this is the first one I've come to that actually has uh, like authentic wall carpets. Usually they might do a whitewash or, uh, or they might do uh, you know murals on the walls and things, but this is actually one of the more common ways of decorating um, both their rooms but also the banquet halls. What an absolutely stunning and gorgeous representation of something that I've seen in art so much and rarely seen recreated. So the people who decked out this hall to make it look as authentic and historical as possible, they did their research. Like I think I've even seen similar just lined um, wall carpets like that in art and how it even kind of folds in to the window alcove, I've seen that in art as well. And then of course we have a more elaborate uh, kind of, um, it would either be brocaded or painted on the cloth and this one is painted on the cloth and uh, not just patterns, but as you see, actual kind of artworks. The utility of it mainly, I feel, is for decoration. Secondary, it could be for extra insulation. And the advantages is if you ever wanted to move or relocate, and this is one of your favorite kind of, you know, um, patterns on the wall, you can take it down and put it up where, where you want it. And so this isn't just something that we see in feasting halls, it's also something that we see in bedrooms and a lot of rooms inside both manor houses and castles. Oh, that it has the hooks! Oh my gosh! It has the hooks that they would hang the, uh, the tapestries and wall carpets on, still on the walls. Oh my gosh, that's a treat. I, I have not seen that yet. I need to uh, <laughs> just geek out about these here because this is like undeniable evidence that they had wall hanging tapestries in this room, just like what we've seen in medieval art. I've only seen one castle that actually had, I guess, a recreation of a medieval room that had wall, wall tapestries. And it's so unknown. Few people really realize that that was a very common way that people decorated their rooms. And so seeing the hooks there to hang them on, and you can see them over here as well. Oh my gosh, that's a treat. Another interesting kind of sight and accuracy, even though this room is probably one of the more accurate in this whole castle, is the furniture. This chair here is an interesting bit of both accuracy and inaccuracy. The overall shape is very accurate to a medieval style chair, but with the people who were remaking this castle, well, a lot of the surviving medieval furniture, all the paint had faded away, and so they've polished it up to reflect an aesthetic of about the 19th century, where furniture, was kind of polished timber. 
And yes, it looks nice, but if you're actually looking at this style of furniture, especially fancy chairs, well, in the medieval period, as we saw at Caerphilly Castle, if there were fancy chairs, they were often painted. Right here is a great example because it doesn't really look like what a lot of people would expect when they think of medieval furniture. Medieval people loved color, especially if you were more wealthy. If you were more wealthy to afford painting, you know, your furniture, and not only furniture, walls as well. If this uh, room was seen in period, in the medieval period, uh, it would have been whitewashed, plastered, and we actually see some of the original plaster still on the wall here. Do you see this? This is original plaster on the wall right there. And so that shows you that this room originally was fully plastered all the way around and would have been whitewashed and it would look pretty stunning as a result. Look at the color of that bed right there, okay? <laughs> It's quite bright and garish, a bit more garish than we might appreciate in the modern day, but we have a different sense of style than they had in the medieval period. This is what a noble bed and a noble chair would have actually looked like. We often think chairs like that, and especially when they're depicted in movies, are stained timber, polished, nice and, and you know sometimes dark brown depending on the the stain that's added. When no, no, that's actually not the case. If you were noble, right? They would be painted and they'd be colorful and it's pretty cool and I wish, I wish I could see, um, I guess, a movie, film, TV show that depicted medieval furniture more accurately. Stuff like what we see here. And there we go, some real life examples debunking a couple of very common castle misconceptions. There's still a lot more first-hand castle content to come. I got to visit even more castles, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. And why not check out my full exploration of Carnarvon Castle? It is amazing. In fact, there's something that I discover that you cannot tell or notice from the outside that I didn't even know was part of Carnarvon's design, but it's extensive and it's incredible. Hope to see you there.